This is a very tedious question. It kind of has like a robotic solution, but it takes a lot to get there. So uh, my first instinct would be pretty straightforward. Um, plug points into equations, right? I'm, I'm very clearly given a point and I'm given an equation. So I might as well plug it in and just see what happens, right? So the nine is the X, the negative 14 is the Y. So going with this equation, we'd have negative 14 is equal to A times nine squared plus B times nine plus C. So we can clean that up. Negative 14 is equal to 81A plus 9B plus C. And looking where we need to end up, it feels like we're kind of close, but we're really not because there's no way for me to just like take the 81 off the A or the nine off the B, like it's just not gonna work. So getting from where we are to there is gonna require some, uh, some cleverness. Um, so I'd be stuck. But, you know, there are some other equations that are associated with quadratics that I might be able to use. Uh, since we're talking about vertex, the one that comes to mind is the um, axis of symmetry formula. So for me, uh, I use this formula a lot when I'm dealing with vertex. The x coordinate of the vertex is equal to negative b over 2a. Well, I know the x coordinate is 9. And this at least gets rid of the c, so I can kind of maybe start to compare these two parts themselves without the interference of the C, I would clean up the fraction. So I'd multiply both sides by 2A. So I get 18A is equal to negative B. And then let's make sure that negative is not kind of lingering there. And we get B is equal to negative 18A. Well, I could substitute that. I could put that into my red equation. And then at least I have one less variable to worry about. So, so maybe that's something. So let's do that. Um, so now I would have, I'll use green to kind of continue the thought process here. 81a plus 9 times negative 18a plus c. All right, well, I can clean this up too. So negative 14 is equal to 81a uh, minus 9 times 18, 9 times 18, 162, 162a plus c. We can combine like terms. Negative 14 is equal to negative 81a plus c. We're still not quite there though, right? Because that C is getting in the way. And, and maybe there are other ways to do this. My instinct though is, okay, we got an equation where B was in terms of A. Now, because I've only got a C and an A here, I could get this equation so that it's C in terms of A. And then I've got everything in terms of A and maybe that'll do something. So this is just mostly like a guess at this point. But I'm going to change color because I'm kind of changing my, my strategy here. I'm going, to, I'm going to add this 81a to both sides so that I end up with c equals 81a minus 14. It's not pretty, but at least it's only got the one variable. Now thinking about what I wanted, right, a plus b plus c, I have a value of b that's in terms of a. I have a value of C that's in terms of A. Maybe I can turn that entire A plus B plus C into just a bunch of A's and then something will click because that's just one variable, right? One is better than three. And with any sort of algebra, the fewer variables you have, the better. So let's just see, right? I'm going to write um, A plus B plus C. So A is just A. B is going to be... Um, I'll put in parentheses, negative 18a, and c is 81a minus 14. So let's clean this up. a minus 18a plus 81a minus 14. We can combine like terms. So uh, 1 minus 18 plus 81 is 64a minus 14. So that's my kind of like my answer. 64a minus 14, uh, let me put the a in there. But that's just like rearranging the answer to have less stuff. But it's still not an answer, right? They, they, these are numbers, right? So what, what do I do? Well, there's one part of this that I didn't use, okay? And it affects the a. I did not use that this thing intersects the x-axis at two points. So what does that mean? Well, if I had a very standard graph and I tried to, to graph this vertex, right? 9, negative 14 is somewhere down here. That's my vertex. Vertex. 
in order for this to intersect the x-axis at two points, it needs to open upwards, right? It needs to open like this. And the only way that that happens is if a is greater than zero, right? That has to be a positive number. So I can kind of use that to my advantage and see what happens now if I try out the different answer choices. Because, right, it's not like, it's not like I need to know all the possible values of a. Look at the question again. Which of the following could be the value of a plus b plus c? The implication there is that there are multiple possible values of this, but there's only four listed and one of them has to be right. The other three have to be wrong. So maybe there's something here where if I don't get a positive A testing out an answer choice, I know that that answer is wrong. So let me just show you what this means, okay? So let's just try choice A here, okay? Negative 23 is the answer. And remember, that's supposed to equal A plus B plus C which we determined is condensed to 64a minus 14. So we can kind of guess and check here, 64a minus 14. And because we only have the one variable now, we can solve for a and see what would happen. So let's do that. I'm gonna add 14, add 14. We're gonna get negative 23, negative, negative 23 plus 14. Uh, is negative 9 equals 64a divide by 64. And you can see the problem already. a, negative 9 divided by 64 is a messy number, but it's negative 0 0.14 with some extra decimals. That's a negative, negative number. Like I said, we can't have a negative number. If it were negative, then the parabola would open downwards and that would not cross the x-axis at all based on this vertex. So this does not work. A cannot be negative in this case for these the conditions that we were given. So choice A would only work if A were this negative number. It's a lot, it's a lot to juggle. So basically, um, we're gonna have to try different answer choices. Now, I'm gonna skip to the right answer because this is already going on long enough. Uh, we're gonna skip to choice D. And I'd probably do this anyway, just because when we have these kind of like questions where there's like a range of possibilities, usually the way it works is the, the, the end of the range is kind of like the answer. So I would go with my biggest or my smallest uh, answer choices and kind of see what they do. And usually that one of them will be right. So let's try the negative 12. So negative 12 is equal to 64a minus 14. Okay, so let's do the same steps. We're gonna solve for a, add 14 to both sides. We're gonna get positive two is equal to 64a. And now when we divide by 64, it's still a messy number, but it's positive. I'll tell you what it is. Two divided by 64 is 0.03125, positive. So there's that, there it goes, that's it. That gave me a valid a that I could use. If I, if I tried c, which is close, Right, negative 14 is equal to 64a minus 14, right? Notice what happens, if I add that 14, I get zero. So the, the 14 is the cutoff, right? Because if I divide by 64, a is zero, which doesn't make any sense. You can't have, then it's not a quadratic anymore, right? Because then it would be zero x squared and that x squared would go away and we just have a line. So um, there might be some math here that we can do that would have gotten us like maybe an inequality that would have shown us that negative 12 has to be the value. I, I think basically instead of going with the guess and check route, if I had taken my mini equations for B and C and plugged them into the discriminant formula, I could have solved this that way. I could have gotten that inequality uh, and seen it for myself, but that sounds complicated. <laughs> so I'm not gonna do it, I'm not gonna bother with it, I'm too afraid I'm gonna mess up. Um, and that just reminds us, you know, like I didn't set out to guess and check here. I didn't know how I could. But I kind of moved the question along and then I kind of got to a point where I couldn't go any further. Uh, and then I was like, well, maybe now I can work it back, right? So the strategic approaches to these questions don't always have to work in one direction. It's not always that we're solving the way the textbook would want and doing it forward to back. Or it's not always that we're doing the strategic approach and working back to forward, right? It, it just depends. And sometimes we can meet in the middle. I think that's what I did here. At no point was I really confident what I was doing, but it all felt right. You know, I was kind of just 
slowly chipping away at this thing until there were fewer variables. And then eventually I was able to solve for something and it kind of worked out. Uh, the challenge, of course, is this is the last question in the section and we'd be short on time. This is a lot of work for not much time, very likely. So uh, this might not be something you even get to and I think that's okay. I think, you know, unless you're really shooting for that 800, your goal should be to start prioritizing these difficult questions at the end. This is not one that I would have spend time on. There are others that are faster, that are easier, that are still t technically hard questions, but are much more gettable. There's really, unless I'm missing something, feel free to comment. Uh, I don't think there's a really quick solution here. I think we got to really think about it and do a lot of algebra to prove it. And it's not time that you're going to have if you're <laughs> anything like me uh, on these math sections. It's, it's a close finish. Uh, so good luck. But don't be afraid to leave some things blank or rather to guess randomly uh, on those questions that you don't get to.